I see a lot of infographics here because I think it's important. You know, this is an interesting tidbits of knowledge, like Facebook usage, privacy, whatever it is. Now, you know, these tables had fabulous pictures of the Nobel Prize winners. Now, you know, these tables had fabulous prizes underneath the chairs. Choose some so you know. Yeah, it's not like that. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, y
And uh, it's something that I think all libraries should do, and I think most everyone does in a way. Um, there's always a couple groups that you know, that you're familiar with, that you've done things with year after year. But how long has it been since you approached a new partner? How long has it been since you've really expanded your world a little bit? Now, are you adjusting the sound? Because I don't, I, I don't sound like I'm on a microphone. Not that I want to. Wow, okay. I'm really here. I feel like I'm talking into a lapel flower or something. It's very 007. Okay, community partnerships. How many of you, um, raise your hands, actually do some things already with people, with other groups in your community outside the library? Does everybody do something? Okay, has it been, a, are you constantly seeking new partnerships or are you kind of just comfy where you are? Okay, okay, that's good. Well, I'm gonna give you a whole bunch of ideas, but first I wanna start um, a little bit with, just by talking about what's great about the library. Now, of course you all know what's great about libraries already, but the funny thing is that we, we in the library field talk so much amongst ourselves that we don't really reach out to others as much as we should. And we, we assume that everyone knows how great the library is. We assume that people know that we have all these great things, that we have all the latest technology, and we have e-books and everything else. And I can tell you from experience, people don't know. Most people, sadly, don't have a clue you know, especially there's still so many people who haven't been into that library since high school or since college. And if you're like me in college was quite a long time ago, things have changed a lot. Um, they really don't have a clue why libraries still matter, especially now in the age of Google and Amazon and Wikipedia. So many people just really honestly don't know why libraries still matter, why they would do anything with you. So I start the handout with um, a list of reasons why libraries are awesome, just to help you uh, give to help give you more things to say when you're approaching the partners. Um, and of course, small business owners. A lot of things. Um, a group that is often approached are the small business owners because everyone says, "Oh, we have business databases." Well, I thought, here's the thing: a lot of people don't even get like. Well, what's a database? Like, they think an Excel spreadsheet. So why do you have business stuff in a database, and why would I care? Like, it's one of the things I'm going to talk about a lot tomorrow in my Accidental Marketer presentation is the lingo and the communication and the way you talk to people and the words that you use to tell them what you have. Uh, it's very important. You can't just say, hey, we have databases, because people say, so, I have Google. Who cares? Um, so you want to say things like we have how-to information for people wanting to start a small business or we have you know um, books that can tell you how to do taxes for a small business things like that uh, computer classes pretty much everyone has figured that out at this point computers internet access hopefully everyone here is on board with that thanks to our friends uh, Uncle Bill and Aunt Melinda a lot more people have uh, computers and access than they than they had uh, some years ago. Homework help, after school programs, uh, expert help. It's another thing that I really want you to think about when you approach potential partners. They think libraries are books. Hopefully a lot of you have seen or read the uh, OCLC report that came out a couple years ago, the Library Perceptions Report. Has anyone seen that? Excellent, very good, you all pass. Um, so if you've seen that, you know that when someone says library, most people's first reaction is books. People who don't read books or people who read e-books, they, they just don't get it. Why would they bother? And one of the things that librarians are bad at doing is <coughs> promoting themselves and promoting their expertise. You know, there's still tons of people who have no idea why you went to library school. Like, oh, is that where you learned the Dewey Decimal System? Ha uh -huh. I know you want to smack people. At least I do. I shouldn't project my rage onto you, but um, I want to smack people when they say things like that. 
they have no idea that you are expert searchers. Um, they just really don't know what you're doing or why you had to get a master's degree for that. So talk about your expertise, talk about the fact that you can find things faster, that you um, can put together lots of information that's vetted and trustworthy, um, and that you're super searchers, really. You know, you, you can do more than Google with a keyword. You can do not only advanced Google search, but even better than that. Um, so you can see lots of the other things here. Um, ESL classes, people with special needs, um, one of the things that's also good to point out, especially if you have some budget battles, is that libraries have been proven to have positive effects on real estate markets. Local real estate markets um, always do, do better with a strong library in town for some reason. For some reason, I don't know why, that's something that new homeowners really look for. People, even if they don't ever come to get a card and use the library, they want to be in a town that has a strong library. I'm not sure why the psychology is like that, but it's true. Um, and there's a link here to one of many articles that carry some of that proof. Um, same with just below that, being a community anchor, a downtown anchor for any kind of town, city. Um, libraries have a long history of doing that. So anyway, just lots of um, things to help you when you sit there and say, oh my gosh, I have a meeting, I'm going to talk to these new people tomorrow. What am I going to say besides, hi, we're the library, and we have more than books. Like, all these things that we take for granted that are so ingrained in us, like, you know, fighting for intellectual freedom, we think everyone knows what we know, but they don't. So, just a list to help get you started. Um, and bonus on the bottom for for people who say, well, you know, libraries don't matter anymore, why they're, they're passe. <laughs> if libraries don't matter, then why is one of the richest and smartest men in the world giving millions of dollars to continue building them up? That's your little gotcha phrase in case you get into trouble with people. So, now I will start into the long, uh, to the litany of the partnership ideas, and I'm going to go through them fairly quickly because there's a lot here, and I want to have time for questions afterwards. And please, um, I, don't be afraid to laugh. In fact, I expect you to laugh in all the right parts, especially you. <laughs> I've gotten to know Julie, and she's a lot of fun. Um, but I definitely want this to be interactive, and um, in order to keep yourselves awake, if you have questions, if you have thoughts, if you want to say something about a partnership that you've done, just shout out, and, um, and I'll pay attention, hopefully. Okay, so I start with the easy things here, the Chamber of Commerce. Most libraries have gotten to the point where they work with people in the Chamber of Commerce, they've gotten to know them, they've spoken at some meetings, they get the attention of the business people. So that's pretty, pretty simple. And if you're part of the Chamber of Commerce, then you probably also have some connections with the groups like the Kiwanis, uh, the Rotary, the Lions Club, things like that. These are very important because this is often where the community leaders are. Uh, people who are also the mayors in a small town or the councilmen or something. They're always part of these other groups. And so joining these groups, if you can, or at least speaking to them, doing presentations, is a great way to get to know them on a first name basis and for them to get to know you. Because sometimes when people get to know a real librarian and you're not the stereotype, it can, it can really change their minds about what libraries can be just by you being yourselves. Number three, this is one of my very favorite things. Um, partner with a grocery store to hold story times there, uh, have a branch there, give discounts, that sort of thing. Many, many years ago, I had an article uh, that was about a project that was called Feed Me a Story. It was one of the coolest things ever, I thought. Um, there was a uh, grocery, I think this is in, uh, yeah, Williamsburg, Virginia area. There was a locally owned grocery store, a small chain called Ucrops, and they had, um, in the years before all these big fancy stores came out, they were one of the first grocery stores to have a big cafe area. And the cafe was sort of upstairs uh, in a little loft, and then a big grocery store was underneath. The library, believe it or not, was too small. 
I know that almost never happens, right? But they didn't have space to do all the programs that they wanted to do. So the library partnered with the Ucrops grocery store to have story times there every Saturday morning. Now the cafe area in the loft didn't open till lunchtime. So the library was able to go in there like, you know, nine or ten o'clock on a Saturday morning, have a story hour there. The grocery store agreed to donate some snacks for the kids related to whatever book they were reading. So they worked together. So if they were um, reading The Runaway Pancake that week, then you know, the kids all got little pancakes. Or if you give a mouse a cookie or something, of course they got mouses to eat. No, <laughs> thank you for being awake. No. Okay, they got cookies, the mouse, the, the mice were elsewhere. Um, but it worked out great, and the parents really, really loved it, because if you've ever been in a grocery store with a small child, and you're pushing the cart, Mommy, I want this, I want this, I want this, give me that, give me the chocolate, give me the candy. So the parents could go and put the children up away in the loft for an hour, get their grocery shopping done, and then get them at the end of story time. It was a beautiful partnership, and it brought new people to the story times who hadn't ever been to the library. It also brought new people to shop in that grocery store that used to shop in other places. So something that sounds so unconventional really turned out to be a beautiful thing. Um, for events at a shopping mall, I had a great article about this where, again, another library out of space, if you can imagine it, um, for a book sale. And you know what it's like when you're having your book sales. And in the month before that, people are dropping off boxes of, you know, National Geographic from 1943. You don't have room to put any of this stuff. So, um, in, in an economic downturn, this particular mall in uh, southeastern Pennsylvania had a lot of empty storefronts, and they were looking to bring business in. So the library worked with them, said to the mall owners, can we have some of your empty stores to take our donations in and to sort everything. And then they had their annual book sale in the shopping mall with like tables and tables, tons of stuff spread out. This way the library was able to take so many more donations than they normally could have fit. They had a lot more space to sell them and it was a big draw to get people to come into the mall. So even, I, I realize that some shopping centers are run by gigantic corporations and you could never find the right human being to talk to, but if you're in a, a location that has something a little bit smaller, don't overlook that because there's still a lot of malls, at least uh, in my area, that have a lot of empty, empty spaces in them and they're looking for ways to draw people in. So, okay, groups with similar values or missions, you probably already do these, historical societies, genealogical groups, um, all types of special interest groups. Who, who is out there who has similar missions to what you do? And that brings me to an important point about partnerships. One of the big things to remember if you want to really be successful in partnerships is for, don't just think, oh my gosh, we have to do something. Who knows somebody somewhere that will do something? What's your point? What's your mission? Like, what do you really want to accomplish with a partnership? What, what are you in need of in your library? Is it space? Is it money? Is it promotion? Is it um, getting in better with the, the town or the county management uh, to make sure you have a budget next year? First, think about what your point is. What is it that you really need? And then think about partners who can help supply that need and things that you can do, you know, they also need things too. So um, your partnerships will be more successful if you have a point in mind and not just run around willy-nilly trying to talk to everyone in town. Okay, number six, um, identify target markets that can use your help, and this is something I'll talk a lot about tomorrow. When you look at groups of people in, in marketing parlance, you want to call them target markets, and it's a, a group of, of like people, you know, a group of like, you can say, well, senior citizens is a target market, but that's really broad. What you really want to do with target markets is narrow it down. So if you're looking at senior citizens, you want to think, okay, seniors between 62 and 70 have very different needs than those between you know, 70 and 85. 
um, seniors who are still active and can drive versus seniors who live in an assisted care facility. You want to narrow down your target market because it makes it a lot easier to communicate with them. And the other thing about that is you want to don't, you don't always have to get right to the big cheese. You don't have to find the owner of the big shopping mall um, or the CEO of the business because as you all know, who, who's really behind most businesses that run? It's, you know, the CEO sits in the big chair and gets the big paycheck, but so often it's their, their administrative assistant or their secretary or their right-hand person that actually makes everything happen. And they're usually a lot easier to reach. So if you're trying to get in good with the mayor or someone like that, you don't have to go right to the mayor. You know, go to the person that works for the mayor, the, the, the peon, as you might say, who, you know, when the mayor says, I need this, go make that happen, little assistant person. That's the person who needs it. That's the person who's searching for the information. The mayor is not sitting there looking up his own stuff or her own stuff. So think about the assistants and the one level down person. If you can become their champion and their information hero, you're going to get a lot of traction with that office. Okay, number seven, trade deals with small business owners. This could be just about anything. Um, one of the simple things you can do if you're having an open house or something like that, and you want to decorate the library with beautiful, fabulous flowers for the open house, but you really can't afford $50 for every little tiny uh, vase of flowers, partner with Betty's Bouquets down the street and say, hi, Betty, you know what? If you can make me six arrangements for uh, and donate them for our library's open house, we will give you in-kind advertising. We will have you put stacks of business cards by each bouquet. We'll put you in the program with an acknowledgement that says, you know, flowers generously provided by Betty's Bouquets. And that way, people are seeing their work, they're getting free advertising. Um, so that kind of thing is so simple, and you might not think of it as a partnership, but it's a great place to start. Um, I just edited an article that's going into the upcoming edition of the New Jersey Library Association newsletter. And it wasn't, it was sort of about marketing, but it was sort of about partnerships. And the librarian who wrote it had, the, had paragraphs on chili, okay, the chili that you eat. Um, there was some big library fundraiser and they wanted to have a chili cook-off and they invited a few of the big restaurants around town to each donate these giant cauldrons of chili. And she sort of didn't feel like she was asking very much because she had been cultivating these restaurant owners for months and months ahead of time. Just, you know, stopping in and saying hi and do you have a library card and, you know, just patronizing the business herself. And then when it came time to ask for donations, these people already knew her and were very happy to donate chili. And of course they named, you know, each of, each of the vats of chili, um, said where it was from and who the chef was and everything. And she actually said um, a few days after this event, she very thoughtfully stopped in again to each of these restaurants that had donated. And one uh, chef in particular said, I've had so much good feedback from your event. So many people came up to me afterwards and said, I really like that. You know, what are your hours? Give me your business card. I'm going to stop in. So they were getting new business from it as well. So any, anything that you're doing for an event, try to see if you can get in-kind donations for it. Okay, blah, 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 blah. Number seven. Gosh, I've been talking forever, and I'm only on number eight. <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, IT experts who might trade their services for your services. You know, repair companies, uh, website hosts, people who build websites. Now I know this one is impossible for everyone because some libraries have particular contracts with, uh, especially if you're part of a city, although I understand more of you here are independent. Um, if you don't have particular contracts that you have to stick to, when you look for new people, there may be something that you can do, you know, don't automatically assume got to go to a big, fat, expensive computer repair company. It's, everything's going to cost me $5,000. You 
you know, ask if you can do something for them or invite them to come into the library and maybe teach a couple classes for, for you. That, actually, that way you're getting everything um, because you're getting the classes and maybe some discounts on your repairs, but they, in exchange, are getting exposure to the public and getting a chance to reach out and find new um, customers for themselves. And that's really the thing about partnerships is you need to have something to offer in return, obviously. Otherwise, it's not really a partnership. It's just, hey, could you do everything for me? Because I'm a little tired of it. <laughs> Which is great. You can do it. Go for it. Um, but, you know, just in case, uh, when you approach a potential partner, have something in mind that you can say, you know, and for all your trouble, here's what we have to offer you. And again, as I said, people have no clue of what you have to offer them. So sometimes they'll be, they might be very pleasantly surprised. Okay, number nine, here's a good one. Uh, contact college professors to see if they can create student projects that are actually real work for you. I mean, so many professors are, uh, you know, marketing classes, art classes, design. They try to come up with all these fake ideas, <coughs> fake projects that they can get people to do. Why should they do something that's only for pretend when they can be doing something real that's useful for you? Uh, I have talked to some people who have had logos designed this way. If, you know, they couldn't afford thousands and thousands of dollars for some big fancy design firm, so they went to the college and asked uh, some of the art or design professors, could you make this a class project? Now, some very important caveats with that, um, that this person had learned. If you're going with non-professionals for anything, for logo design, for website design, uh, any kind of anything, make sure somehow that in your little contest there's a clause that says you do not have to actually use what they come up with because you could get 10 different logos that are unbelievably ugly, okay? I mean, it probably won't happen, but you could. So you want to make sure that, um, especially if it's something where the teacher is wants to decide or you know, you're going to pick three top logos and put it up for a public vote or something, um, definitely make sure that you're not roped into keeping what someone else has decided is right for you. Because just in case it doesn't work out, you don't want to have an ugly logo for the next decade. But, but think about the colleges nearby, and I think you all have a few here. Um, think about how they can help you. And, and again, that helps the teacher and the professor because then they don't have to think of a whole new fake project every semester to have the kids do. So, okay, number 10, scout troops, youth organizations. You know all those cute little scouts that are out there selling stuff and, you know, delivering Girl Scout cookies and everything? They have to do community service projects. But, you know, there's badges to be earned, but there's also all kinds of um, different things that they need to do to move up in the different levels. As scouts, I've talked to librarians who have had some new uh, bookcases built or display, like they needed a nice new display table on wheels that they could move around. And, you know, nothing against the vendors, but have you looked at the furniture catalogs for library vendors? Oh my gosh, every chair is $1,000. Um, so if you need a little something that could be homegrown, ask a scout to do it. You know, uh, gardening out front, a little bit of landscaping, a flower bed, a new sign. Any of those simple things could become projects for cute little scouts to do. And they will get the experience and get their badges. And then you're also getting buy-in from everyone who works on that project because then they get to know more about the library. And they're invested in it, and they want to bring all their family in and say, come on, I, I, was, I built this, this shelf to get my badge, so everyone in the family, you have to come and see it, and you're going to put the picture on their Facebook page and all that stuff. So this is how these sort of things blossom. Um, form an alliance. So here's uh, an interesting one, and I wonder if anyone has ever done this, with uh, video game stores or skateboard shops or arcades or something. I, I hear so often that, you know, those darn teenagers, they're the, you know, we need to get them off the streets and into the library, but they're so hard to attract. So if you do partnerships with types of places where they already hang out, 
it, it's a way to bring them in. Um, there's all kinds of exchanges. You you know, read X number of books during your summer reading and get a coupon for, you know, a free video game or something like that. Uh -huh. um, when I worked in um, Seahawks Free in Colorado, we worked out um, the reading program theme was a, a mystery theme. Mm -hmm. And we had a cutout of a character. And then at the library, we had clues of where the character was going to be. And the sponsor shops and um, vendor uh, um, stores and things in town would post this character for a week. And then the children were supposed to figure out, you know, where it was. With the <coughs> and then um, whoever won it um, would get like a prize package of things from the store and stuff like that. That's cool. That's and nice. we did one of these. And it was really fun. It was, really did, did it, was everyone able to hear that? Mm -hmm. Um, ju it, just in case not for the recording, I think the gist of it was that um, part of your, was it was summer reading, right? Part of the summer reading was there was a character that would be hidden in different places around town, different businesses would post this character or hide it in the stores, and as the kids went around to find it, then they got points for that and they could earn prizes by also finding the character. Is that the basic? Pretty cool. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Okay, talk to her later and, and hear more about her good idea. <laughs> Has anyone else done anything like specifically for teenagers, like like video stores or anything? Uh -huh. Well, I didn't do it, but my young adult coordinator at our at our library, Melissa, she gives. I always thought it was a great idea, but the kids that come to the program that she offers get bonus bucks, so they get so many for each event that they go to. And then she has a store that they can use her bonus bucks, where she has gotten all kinds of different things. Nice. And okay, so kids who come to programs earn bonus, bonus bucks, bucks that they can then use to buy things later in the store that she had. Now, has she gotten uh, the things in her store donated from different places? Some of them, or? some of them, yes. She's had grants to do this, and okay. then, you know, just from her budget for the YAs. So I think it's great. I would like to try it with adults, but I don't think it would work to get them to programs. <laughs> yeah, getting adults to programs. Um, we can talk about that after, if, you, if, if nothing else hits that. Um, but sometimes even one of the things that comes immediately to mind for getting adults to programs <coughs> is so often uh, the library staff, and, and of course you never have enough staff either, just like you never have enough money, one of the great things I've been hearing about lately is getting people from the community to present the programs oh. specifically. Like if you're, you know, an expert knitter or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And if you get people outside the library to do the presenting, then they're going to tell their friends, who are going to tell their friends, and then, you, you know, their friends may come to the program if they have a genuine interest, or they may come just to heckle their friend or something, or to see what it's all about, but it gets new people at least talking about the library. So that's one little quick thing that, that might help with some of the some of the grown-ups. Um, okay, number 12, I'm on right now. Uh, similar to the other one, school gaming clubs. Um, I know that a lot of libraries in recent years have tried to get gaming things going, uh, you know, chess, board games, video games, <coughs> multiplayer online video games. And if, sometimes they just can't seem to get the people interested in coming to the library because they all already game somewhere else. Well, go find out where that somewhere else is and go talk to them and see if you can work together. Maybe the library has a bigger space than the other place. Or maybe they can put uh, all their tech together so instead of just having you know, six gaming stations here, you can put it all together and have 20 and have a giant event. Um, a library in the, in the Netherlands where some of my colleagues were have actually had overnight like 24 hour gaming nights with the big uh, online things where they're playing other people all around the world and they get you know parents permission and everything and kids pack their clothes and their food and they literally are locked in for 24 hours just sitting in the dark all playing games. Uh, sounds a little scary to me, but um, <laughs> it, it was a really, really big draw. And with that sort of thing, all it takes is, is one cool kid to say, oh, I'm going to that. And then suddenly everyone else has to go to that. 
So don't overlook the power of peer pressure in your partnerships either. Um, 13, have a dine and donate night. These are really big where I am in New Jersey. There's a lot of restaurants that will work with you to have a dine and donate, and they'll say, you know, this one particular day, 10% of all the proceeds will go to your cause. And do people do that here already? Is that a, that's a thing? Okay. Um, and the restaurants love it too, because then they get people coming in who never would have come into their restaurant before. So that's a really, that's a good one that helps everyone in the community. And besides, you know, we all gotta eat. Anyone else dislike cooking? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> restaurants, let's do it. Okay. Um, Instigate meetings, office assistants, liaisons, government officials. Um, actually sitting down with people, sometimes just don't walk up and ask for a partnership, but just have a little meeting with them, have coffee, invite them to breakfast or something, and say, what are your information needs? What are you trying to do? Especially with government officials, uh, city planners, you know, they're they're always looking for information that you sent to state, and they're thinking, well, how soon are we going to have to widen this highway? You know, are we going to need to build another assisted living facility soon because our community is aging, <coughs> something like that? They're always looking to plan ahead. And who can find data better than you? Nobody. Um, they may think that they have a mind to all of that, but I guarantee that your reference librarians can find <coughs> things that, that they cannot find on Google uh, or in the census. So um, definitely look at talking to them about their needs and then who knows what grows from that. Once they start to see you as the information experts, A, beautiful things can happen, and B, when they're sitting there with their budget and their red pen ready to cross out your line item, they might think, you know, they really helped me on my latest planning document, on my presentation. That, you know, yeah, I guess the library is still important in the age of Google. 15, okay, something totally different. Uh, big organizations like AARP. Um, I've had articles where <coughs> libraries have joined with their local AARP. Not that any of you would know that that's the American Association of Retired Persons. Um, I, I would like to know that much sooner than I'm going to, but um, they need a place to reach people. They wanted to have a lunch and learn, or they wanted to come in, and basically they needed meeting space. They needed a space where they could get a lot of people together, where everyone could find it. You know, we want to have a local event where we sit down and explain the changes to Medicare, or something like that. that people really need the information. The library can just be the place where that can happen. And the library can also help to put together <coughs> handouts or information sheets or take the, the people after the meeting and say, you know, here's all the information you just got. Let me show you a couple of places where you can find more. You know, here's a resource for this, here's something for that. And by the way, everyone in the meeting today, do you all have a library card? So that you can use our other things afterward. When you get people into the library for things like meetings, make sure that they have cards. You know, don't be shy. Go out, you know, take your, if your form is still on paper, take it right out there, put them on the table. Okay, everyone, before you leave, you know, library card's free, sign up. Um, and then people have a lot more incentive to come back. Um, this is one I, I'm curious to see if y'all have here. The welcome wagon or the greeters groups? Do you have something like that that goes around to people who are new in the community and says, and they say, hi, here's where the welcome wagon, you don't see some way. Okay, well here's what welcome wagon is. Um, in, in a lot of areas, there's a, I think it's just a volunteer position basically, and happened whenever I moved to my most recent town about 15 years ago. Someone literally, you know, they, they work with the real estate agents, so they know who's new in town. And they knock on your door with a big basket of stuff, and they come in and say, hi, I'm the welcome wagon, welcome to your new town. And they give you one of everything from their basket, you know, brochures about the library, uh, brochures from all the dentist office in town. Uh, I, I, for some reason, I can't forget one of the little giveaways I got was a big refrigerator magnet in the shape of a tooth. 
you know, advertising that particular day. And I never went there because seeing the tooth on the fridge just freaked me out. <laughs> so don't, don't make tooth magnets. <laughs> but, um, you know, so they, they give away the, the businesses who want to be known to the newcomers and who want to do that kind of personal advertising <coughs> fill up these greeting baskets and lovely people go and give them out. So definitely if you have any services like that, and even if, if you don't have that service around, go to your realtor's office. Because remember, you can tell them and you can look up information how good libraries uh, keep up the real estate prices. So make sure that whenever they are talking to people, you know, here's a selling point. Here's the brochure about our library. Here's our website. Tell them how strong we are. Tell them what great programs we have. Um, maybe it'll help you make a sale. Plus, people are already introduced to the library before they even get in town. So, okay, look at that part. Partner with pediatricians to reach parents of young children. Um, has anyone done this? Has anyone worked with pediatricians' offices, um, foster care places? Um, okay. We, we, not pediatricians per se, but hospitals, newborns get a, a packet and an invitation to get a library card for their child. Awesome. So newborn packets, uh, that's a great thing. And there was uh, something in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, uh, the state capitol there had a big grant a couple of years ago to do that sort of thing. They had like little bibs print, you know, the, my first <coughs> bib, or you know, uh, feed a reader or something like that. They had little giveaways made and also library card applications in them. And they actually went so far with this grant in Pennsylvania uh, of making a calendar for like, you know, baby's first year calendar. And it was one of the things that, um, I think you filled in the, the dates yourself according to when the child was born, but it had helpful information on it. Like, you know, at three months, have you been vaccinated for this, this, and this? Uh, and just the basic, like, the, what you need to know the first year having a child. You know, don't forget to register for this. And of course, they accidentally sort of slipped in some library, you know, don't forget we have story times every Wednesday, things like that. So uh, reaching new parents is a great way. You know, the adults that you're trying to get to come to your adult <coughs> programs, if, if they're new parents, their whole lives are gonna be pretty much devoted to the kids. But so if you can get them to start bringing their children right away, that's a beautiful thing. And something else that works really nicely is uh, to get the parents in. When you're ha if you wanna have a program for parents, have something for the kids at the very same time. So they can come in, leave the kids in that room over there, and then they get to attend something, you know, have a movie night for the kids or something. Um, you know that you hate it when parents just drop off the kids, but if it's, if it's a program that you planned, a dual program, that can be another way to, to bring the parents in. Okay, here's uh, 18 is something that probably a lot of you do already, working with the museums, uh, the zoo, the orchestra, all kinds of cultural centers. I know that more libraries now are um, getting like free museum passes that people can check out from the library. They can be used over and over again because the museum just gives them to you to partner. But then it's something great that you can advertise, something that you can promote that, you know, oh, if you're a member of the library with your card, you can check out free passes to the museum, you know, that are good from, you know, Monday through Friday or something like that. Does anyone here do that already? Any museum passes, zoo passses? No, Jocelyn's. Well, there you go. <laughs> go immediately to the museum that I just saw from my hotel window that's like right down the street um, and see if you can do something with them because you have a lot of things in common already as cultural <coughs> institutions and, and places of education. So see if you can, uh, if you can work out some of that. Make, and, and as if that's not big enough, make allies of everyone in your community. I'm not going for small stuff here. Um, I have had articles, one of them that I listed here, um, for book sponsors. And actually, uh, a lot of places on the East Coast that were now hit by Hurricane Sandy are doing the book sponsor thing. Um, I think it's Urban Libraries Unite, which is based in New York State. They have, they put a huge wish list 
on Am Amazon knows Powell's books. A lot of places have done it on Amazon too. You can make a list of all the books that you need or that you want and advertise to the community. You know, here's a really, really easy way to donate. Here's the URL for our list. We have books there ranging from $3 to $87. You can order it there, have it shipped directly to us. You know, we'll put a nameplate in it for you or something like that. And this is a way that if your collection budget uh, has dwindled, if, I say that like it's, it doesn't happen. Um, or if, you know, in times of uh, need with the disasters, when a lot of collections were just wiped out, they're counting on this to really rebuild some of their collections. So working with these online stores can be a really easy way to, to do that. I've also seen people do it uh, for Christmas time with the Christmas tree. Have you seen the wish trees? where there's a tree and you know you write down or the child writes down the gift that they would like to get and they hang it on the tree and then all the good Samaritans can go and, and pick a thing off the tree and go and buy it to donate. So there's all kinds of ways that you can just do that community-wide and uh, make everyone aware of your needs too because the funny thing is I mean I joke about how little money libraries have and you go, oh I know you that you have way too much money and too much staff but a lot of people don't know. They, you know, you know all those people who walk in your library and say, my, my taxes pay your salary, so you have plenty of money. People think that libraries have money. I know, it's crazy, isn't it? Because, uh, you know, they walk in and they see thousands of books and they think, oh my gosh, you're not hurting for anything. But one of the things uh, also that OCLC and the Gates Foundation learned when they set up the, Beak, the library project, I don't know if any of you have been geeking the library, but one of the things that their studies found is that people assume that libraries have plenty of funding because, you know, it comes from the, the federal government, right? I mean, they just hand out money to everybody, so that's how your library runs. And most people who haven't, you know, sat down at your budget meetings don't realize that your funding has been cut. And so sometimes, with the really nice people, all you have to do is let them know what kind of condition you're in, um, or that you're in, in jeopardy of having hours cut, or that your collections budget has been slashed in half. And sometimes they'll say, oh my gosh, I, I thought the state and the feds just totally took care of you. Um, but again, if, unless you say it to them, they have their own assumptions. Well, they're free library. Mm. Yeah, right. They're free. Everything's free. Just drops from the sky. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's Why free to you as well as it is to me. No, no, dear. <laughs> we have to pay for all those things. And they think, you know, even like with the Gates grants, the computers. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, they gave you those computers, so they're free. Okay, yeah, but not forever. And not the internet access isn't free forever, and all that. Uh, people are crazy. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but that's a whole other presentation. I'll do that another time. Um, number 20, help reporters to fill the void. Um, everybody wants to get good press at some point or another. You have something going on, you want to get some media coverage, but how do you do that? If you haven't, but, well, the answer is build a long-term relationship with the editors and get to know them, take them to coffee, be nice to them, blah, blah, blah. But again, that's another, that's another presentation. Um, <coughs> but here's the other thing. Media are used to people saying, me, me, me. Give me something, cover me. I need, you know, three minutes of airtime, or I, I really need six inches of copy space to get my message out. And can you imagine someone in the media sitting there saying, oh yeah, well what can you do for me? Well tell them that you can be their go-to research assistants. You would think it would be obvious. Again, not always obvious. Um, and I know that in, in the state of journalism today, my degree, my, initially my degree is in journalism, they don't teach journalism like they used to. And um, the, the people who are working for what newspapers are left at this point are either like the grizzled old veterans who are going to die with that paper or they're new 23 year old kids who just got out of school and can afford a job that pays almost nothing because they have no life and no responsibility yet. So um, just by telling them, like say, 
don't Google that. If you're working on an important story, don't Google everything. You know, come to me, send me questions. Our reference desk is open. These are, this is what we're here for. Let us help you write better articles. Let us help you make better coverage. And just by reframing it, sort of by spinning it that way, might actually get a couple people to use Google a little less. No promises, but uh, it's certainly worth a shot because I have read some really, really lousy journalism in the past few years. Okay, here's an interesting one. 21, getting involved with emergency workers, firefighters, police. Um, so often, libraries see them as competition because they compete for your budget. The firefighters, the police, the Parks Commission, Parks and Rec, all that sort of thing, um, often are taking money from the same pool as you are. And when it comes down to budget battles and to votes especially, everyone is afraid to vote for the library budget over the fireman's budget because, oh my gosh, my house is gonna burn down tomorrow. Um, but in, in New York State, they did something really interesting. Uh, New York State has, and I think I gave you a link, has a program of the Mid-Hudson Regional Library System called Building Your Base. And they are doing fantastic target marketing. One of the groups that they decided to target specifically is firefighters. And what they did, you know, they, they reached out to the, to the fire chief and said, did you know that we have all this stuff? To, because apparently, and I never knew this, firefighters have to do certain things to keep their, I want to say certification, whatever they call it. Um, they have to take exams. They have to, you know, do so much reading. They have to keep up with all the fire tech. Because just like people think libraries aren't techy, they think firemen are just hoses, but they have a lot of technology on these trucks now. And so anyway, people at Mid-Hudson reached out to the firefighters and said, did you know that we can proctor exams on, like when you have to sit online and take those certification exams, you can do that at the library. Because they can't sit and do it in their firehouse and have their buddy proctor the test because that's kind of cheating. Um, they also said, you guys are probably in every single firehouse are subscribing to your own three periodicals. Well, did, didn't you know that we get fire and brush news here in the library? And didn't you know that we get, you know, truck tech magazine in the library? And like, we're already buying this for you as part of the community. So you can save money by stopping your subscriptions. At any rate, they made friends with the fire company by doing all these things and explaining what they had. And then suddenly there wasn't quite, I don't want to say animosity, but the firemen themselves, you know, when it came time for budget discussions, they, the firemen were not trashing the library saying, we don't need that. You know, forget the library, we need the money. Because they had come to realize the value of the library and what it could really do for everybody. And on the Building Your Base website, it, it's, you could, I, maybe you could, I could get lost in there. I could spend all day on the site. They have all kinds of information just like that, specifically for many different target markets. And they have been really successful going to one group at a time, explaining the value of the library and what it has to offer, and making, forming whole new relationships with groups that never used the library before. Um, Hunters and Sportsmen was another one. You know, everyone's subscribing to their own field and stream uh, while it's at the library. Did you know that you know you can get your hunting license here? So we have a notary and all that sort of thing. So um, and it was a lot of rural stuff too. So definitely take a look at the building your base site. Who knows what you'll come up with? Um, Twenty-two. I talked about this a little bit earlier. Senior centers, nursing homes. Um, and again, there's a lot of back and forth. I've read about a lot of libraries who have partnered with senior centers to get the seniors help with things. Like they're great at listening to kids read, helping kids learn to read. Um, they're good with obviously uh, intergenerational programs, you know, for someone to sit down and like, back in my day, you know, we walked to school in the snow, uphill both ways. Um, and not, o not only the uphill both ways, uh, which I still haven't figured out. <laughs> but um, 
to programs on any any historical thing to get an actual human being to come in. You know, like I can stand here and say, in the War, war of 1812, this is what happened. What, if you could find someone who remembers the War of 1812? <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you how much press coverage you're going to get from that. <laughs> It'll be, the new papers will be all over you. Um, but really, they can help out with a lot of things. And uh, volunteers, not, not just even for pages, but really for helping with programs, helping to tutor kids. Uh, there's a lot of potential there. Um, one of my favorite things, which actually was, was sort of a partnership, but it benefited uh, more the Assisted Living Center. Years ago, I had an article in uh, Marketing Library Services. By the way, <laughs> if, if, if you all have never seen the marketing newsletter, come on up and, and take a look when we're done. Um, I have a lot of case studies in there and lots of good ideas. And, and I don't write all this stuff. The librarians who have actually done certain campaigns and certain programs write their own experiences about what worked and what didn't work and that's what I deliver in the newsletter. And one of my favorites was about a group that went, I think every week, to a senior center and they used to like take our large print books and sit and you know, be great. But then they decided seniors really wanted to be more active. So they took their Wii games to the senior center and set them up and they were teaching people bowling and tennis and it was really, really enjoyable, and it made everybody involved see the library in a different light. Like, it's not just when I want to sit in my rocking chair and read a book, you know, it was a lot more than that. And I remember that the cover of that particular issue had a picture of a bunch of seniors, you know, to, standing there with their game controllers, and one of them was like this, and one little tiny old lady, about four feet tall, she was standing there going, ah. <laughs> <laughs> so out of game. I'm like, you know, so young and vital, and it was a very cool thing. So there's a lot that you can do uh, with groups like that. <sighs> okay, 23, parents. I know that y'all already, you're, you're, you talk to parents, you try to get them to come in for programs, you try to get the kids library cards, but do you really think of them as partners in learning? You know, is the library just a place where they can drop the kids off for a while while they go to the grocery store? or? Is it a place that they really think of as seriously educational? Like, do they know that you, and you can't just say like, well, we have tutor.com, because nobody knows what that is. You know, we have software that can help your kids get their homework done. We do have, we have human tutors available. I know in my little tiny town's library, every time I go in there, there's a certain table in the corner where someone is always being tutored. Uh, by an adult, and it's just like their little tutoring corner. Um, do they realize that you can offer individual help, and, and in fact that you're more than books, that you can sit down and that there are educational things that the kids can do, if you have a chess club or whatever, uh, if they want a safe place to have their kids go for events, do they really know what you do there? And sometimes, um, when I say sit down with the parent, like you can't just invite the whole community in and sit right down and have some coffee. Um, but realistically, in small groups or go to your local schools, make sure you tell the teachers everything. Uh, go to the PTA, see if you can have a presentation with the Parent Teacher Association to tell them all the different things that you offer now that a library never did when they were little kids. So parents can be very important partners. Um, hey, and, well, teachers, look at that. I segued right into my own next one. Um, K-12 teachers, I know that a lot of people work with teachers as a matter of course for summer reading. Do you do anything besides summer reading with them? Like, the teachers are there, you know, the whole rest of the year. Um, do, do you put lesson plans together? Do you talk about the lesson plans and build collections around them? Uh-huh. We've partnered with them for several things. We have, um, well, it used to be Pomida in our town, and it's now Shaco. But every year during the summer, they donate all of their extra books to us. So we get like 32 boxes of books. So we hold an open house for the teachers during their orientation week so they can come get books for their classrooms. And we feed them lunch and everything, and then sit down and talk to them about what they're going to be doing through the year so we can purchase our books to complement their curriculum. Perfect. 
That's perfect. Ta uh, talking with teachers about their curriculum so that you can purchase the books. Um, getting, how do you get extra books? Oh, what school has extra books to donate to you? It's, no, it's not Maida. It's like retail store. Oh, it's the okay. Yeah. Okay. So and they just clean house every summer and they donate all the book stuff. That's a, that's fantastic. All um, right. Anyone else? Do you do what, what do you do with your schools besides summer reading? Yeah, uh -huh. they do. Um, our children's people do third grade tours where all the third graders come over and are introduced to the catalog and the library and so forth. Cool. Okay, tours for the third graders so they get to see what the library is all about. I like that. Yeah, what about you? Well, I don't know. One of the teachers got a car bill branch, whatever that was. So every month the teachers had in service and they sent all the kids to the library that afternoon and we've gotten a coordinator now that is presenting programs once a month for all the children on in service. <coughs> okay, so then in, in service day once a month. Once a month and then wow. and then it's kind of all the way. Okay. Yesterday or something we had about fifty five minutes. Wow. And a lot of them are better than four. Parents? <laughs> so that's great. So the teachers on their in-service days for the afternoon send all the kids to the public library, which is a good place to put them. I mean, they have as an option. As long as parents don't want them. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess they can go home. You know, I mean, yeah. At first we talked about a bus service, but then we decided that, you know, we really couldn't have 100 kids or whatever. Because yeah, yeah. it's K through 5. So, you can't have the whole school come to the library no, all at once. No. So, but you know, well, the other day that was a big, that's a big crowd, 55, we have a huge space for that. Yeah, 55 kids, mm -hmm. all, all sugared up. And <laughs> all sugared up. <laughs> Yay! <Yeah. laughs> Actually, that reminds me, I was um, in a recent issue of MLS, someone was talking about a public library in Connecticut, in Stanford, Connecticut that has had a very long-term partnership with the schools, and I forget what, if it's third grade or first grade, but for a billion years, they have always had an afternoon where they bring all the kids, not all at once, bring all the kids to the library. And the library, Ferguson, actually has a purple bus. Like, they bought an old school bus years ago, and painted it purple, and put all kinds of crazy stuff on it. And in whatever grade it is, first or, or second grade, during one day, every single kid in the school is bused to the library, and they get a tour, and they get their library cards, and they get a little snack, and they have a little program and everything. So that way, everybody, whenever they're young, everyone who goes through that whole school system gets a card and gets familiar, too. And, and the tour is a nice part of it because like when I was a little kid and I walked into the library, I was in awe, and I loved it, but I was a geek. Okay, so not everyone's like that. You can walk into a gigantic lot, you know, and you say, oh, we have a collection of 250 million books. That sounds really good to you, but that can really intimidate some people. Like you just walk in and there's stuff everywhere. Where do I start? Where do I go? What do I do? So to be introduced to that when you're small and, you know, told that there is some order to things and there are people here to help you and just to know what's available, and then it's not just books, but also <coughs> software and movies and games and programs. We can make a really big we difference. We partner with a life skills class, mm -hmm. and once a week they come to the library. I'm by So you have a little program, the teacher provides the program. Okay. They choose books. Um, you know, okay. so, so you partner with a life skills class? And in the school system. Oh, it's part of the schools, okay. Mm -hmm. But they come <coughs> And they're so excited. That's the, and how old are they? From K through into the class. Oh really? Okay. Wow. Kind of, I, I don't know. It's a it's a I think life skills goes to they're twenty one. Okay. Um so and I think they divide it that much. So the older come one day and the other So so people every week come from life skills classes. Wow, the library is a life skill. Don't you think that should be that, that should be the core of their curriculum? That's awesome. 
Awesome. Anybody else doing anything like that with education? Yeah. This isn't with education, but our friends sponsor a writing contest every year for our fifth through uh, ninth grade, eighth grade. <laughs> and um, the winners, and each grade has its own winner, um, three winners. The libraries of those uh, uh, contest winners also get uh, a $100 prize, same as the child. <coughs> nice. It's becoming more and more popular. Then we also partner with, um, and a lot of people do this, probably the One Book One community, partner with the schools to read the book. Okay. Okay, that's great. So the first thing that she said, in case anyone didn't hear, was a writing contest for fifth through eighth grade students. And each of the winners, not only does the child get a hundred dollar prize, but their school library, school or public library, gets a hundred dollar prize as Either. well. Or homeschool. Okay. Or homeschool. Okay. I could use that <laughs> to build my home library. <laughs> okay, anybody else on that? On that part, yeah. The, uh, in addition to all the tours that come through the different age groups of the schools, we have a middle school and a high school book club that meet at the school. And then also the school psychologists meet once a month at our library. And a lot of teachers have discovered that our meeting room is an excellent place to do their planning. Sure. So when the schools were closed uh, a few weeks ago, we had teachers in there for the two days planning. So, and, and we've got Wi-Fi, so that helps too. Okay, so teachers planning, planning and school psychologists coming in to use your rooms to do planning. Interesting. I, I would like to delve into the psyche of why they think the library <laughs> is a good place for that. Um, we're friendly. There you go. <laughs> friendly, friendly. We're and we are part of the community. That's what you want to be. That's exactly it. And and really, that's that's a great way to think about the partnerships because it's not just, you know, here's your community and here's the library and here's the hardware store and here's the school and here's the post office. That, you know, that is just a collection of buildings in the same area. It's really not community until people are working together and knowing, you know, why doesn't the person at the hardware store know the person from the school who knows the person from the library. And just representing the library in other whatever clubs you're part of or whatever groups or organizations or nonprofits that you work for is just being a representative of a library is a great thing and that's getting a lot into the the idea of embedded librarianship that um, I think it's something that people have always done but now it's it's a buzz phrase because now they're calling it embedded librarianship <laughs> where you're you're representing your library at the PTA or at the Rotary Club or whatever. And uh, groups in Colorado have been doing that with, uh, and other places, but I just had an article from Colorado. They're having great success just having uh, a librarian join a group. And when the group's sitting there saying, we really need to plan for next year's fundraiser. Does anyone know the statistics about blah, blah, blah? And the librarian says, oh, yeah, I can hang on, sh sh got my phone. And they look it right up and give it to them, and people are just astonished. And then they realize the value of the library. So the last thing I have on here, which I'm sure you've already read while I was blathering on, um, forming relationships with consultants, marketing, advertising, image, branding people, space planners. Um, here's the tricky thing. They need information to do their business transactions and to work for their clients. You have the information. Would you give it to them for nothing? Sure you would. Do you have to tell them that? Not at first. <laughs> they, oh, we can make you more successful. We can help you with your clients. We can help you do your research. Just approaching them with that specific partnership in mind. Um, and who knows, you know, maybe in return for, you know, in return for doing something for you for this particular project, we're having a little problem with our space planning here, and we want to redo this section, you know, but we're a little short on ideas. What do you think might work? Just a little casual back and forth. So, um, that's the main stuff. And as you see, uh, just very quickly, I'll point out that I have tips and strategies here because it's great to go home with a pocket full of ideas, and then you wake up tomorrow and you go to work and you say, okay, how am I going to start this? What am I going to do? 
Um, some of these I've covered already. Uh, to choose potential partners, know exactly what you need and what you want to achieve. This is something that sometimes libraries aren't great at because you're so short-staffed and you're in such a hurry and you just want to do all the great stuff and you want to do this and this and this and this and you don't take the time to sit down and make always a concrete plan unless it's for something like technology um, where you sort of have to have a plan but really think about what do you most want to achieve and start your partnerships from there. Um, look at the potential partners to see who fits well. I mean, you're the ones who know how to find out everything about everybody else. So go look them up, you know, do some research for yourself on the different organizations. Um, it's e definitely easier to start with someone that you already know, someone that you're comfortable with, someone that you have a relationship with. is a lot easier for a first time out than a cold call with, uh, with a stranger. Here's one that a lot of you maybe couldn't say out loud, but I can because I'm not working in a library right now. Um, your director, who often wants to be the one to do everything, they may not be the best person to do this. Um, they may, there may be other people, there may be paraprofessionals with the best connections who belong to the Lions Club, who happens to have just gotten a $50,000 grant. Um, really, whoever's the most comfortable talking about a topic or whoever has the best connection, should be the one to reach out to that particular organization. And the libraries that are most successful with this, who are doing a lot of the embedding, are letting everybody in the library choose what group you want to work with. Who do you know? You know, who, who can you start to talk to for us? So uh, don't let the director say, well, nobody else can ever do this because I have to be in charge of it. Because they just, they can't do everything, and, and uh, other people have better connections. Here's, here's one that's fun, and sometimes when I do this talk as a longer <coughs> workshop, we actually do some role playing. And I ask people to come up and talk to me, pretend that I am whomever they're seeking some kind of partnership with. You know, I'm the director of the museum or something. And I have them come up to me and ask what they want. And of course, I mean it nasty. And I initially say, "No, you suck." What you know about libraries? And then, you know, they can justify, which is the fun part, at least for me. Um, I don't know about that, but um, really, really, if you're not especially comfortable talking with people, asking for things, if you stumble over your words a little bit, if you're not sure how to put it, seriously, honestly, role play it with some other people. You're going to feel silly looking at, at your friend or your spouse and, and doing this, but running over something, saying it out loud several times, I have found as a speaker makes a huge difference that when you're actually in the situation, it comes to you more quickly and you're not stumbling through your words. And if you're going to make a fool of yourself, for God's sake, do it with friends before you get out to the other people. That's really the bottom line there. Um, using documented facts, that's a big one. Um, I know we've had a little trouble with facts lately in the country, like, you know, when is a fact really a fact, but you guys know when a fact is really a fact. Um, and at this point, I want to point out here too, um, speaking of facts, does anyone know uh, the ICMA, the International City County Management Association? <gasps> Yay! You got, most places I go, they're like, the what? They are full of awesome, and they have a lot of reports on their website, studies that they have done about city county managers working with libraries, partnering with libraries. They have some fantastic studies on there that were written for the county management types that say, here are all the economic benefits of working with your local public library. So if your uh, people don't know that, or even, it, they might know it, so what? Show them that you know it. Like, take some of these reports, you can download them for free, print them out, um, share it with them, and say, look, here are a lot of the benefits. Um, it's not me, the librarian, saying work with me, it's people like you, it's people in your trade association saying how great it is. So when you present most people with the facts, uh, it helps, not all of them. <clears throat> no names will be named. Um, <laughs> social networks, of course, that works into partnerships as well. Uh, for social networks, work into everything these days. They're um, kind of worming their ways into our lives in a permanent way. But one of the easy ways to do that is as 
as your library organization, if you have Facebook account, Twitter, or something like that, follow, follow the organizations you want to partner with and invite them to follow you as well. It, it's like spying legally. It's the easiest way to see everything they're doing, everything they're talking about, and they can see what you're doing and you can really get a feel for how they talk, what's important to them, all that sort of thing. Um, start small. I always say start small, especially with, it, partnerships are a little easier. When I talk to people about things like writing marketing plans, um, it seems like a big scary thing, but just, you know, start small, get a little success under your belt, take baby steps, and keep going. Um, it's not all about money. Well, okay, it's mostly about money, but um, relationships are valuable because they can lead to money. So in the end, it's, it's mostly all about money. Um, partner, oh yeah, that's a long story, um, which I won't tell you right now, but there was a very interesting conference in Denmark, but like almost an unconference, which was just more of big discussions, where they were talking a lot about partnerships. And someone would bring up an idea of partnering with you know X group, and the other people would say, that's preposterous. That's, you know, that would never work. And then one person would come up and say, well, you know what, I did that. And here's how it worked and here's why. And the point of this really being, I'm sure that a couple of the things I've said tonight definitely will sound preposterous to some of you, in, depending on your situation. But don't take anything off the table without getting some different viewpoints about it. Because the one partner that you think is totally silly could be the one that ends up um, being the most profitable for you. Um, and also, always start with the good opening line. Like, like in, you know, like you gotta have a pickup line for your partnerships, just like you would uh, for your dates. <laughs> <laughs> this is why you practice. <laughs> this is why you practice. <laughs> hey, now don't do it right now, girls. Calm <laughs> down. Oh, Some of us need practice. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we can, we, we should practice afterwards, yes. Uh, something, something simple and safe, like, I want to make you an offer you can't refuse. <laughs> something, you know, a little bit, a humor. Humor really, really helps. I mean, it's kept you guys awake after dinner for an hour. <laughs> it works. Um, so I just have at the end uh, some really great things that you can look up on your own time, because I know you're all going to rush right home and look this stuff up. Um, in my fantasy world. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, this, this study from Denmark is one of the things that I've put in there. Um, really, really, really amazing comprehensive document about the science of partnerships uh, with some really great points, some excellent quotes that you can use. And there's a couple other things in there too. So that's, that's my giant batch of ideas rolled together with hopefully some inspiration and some good lines and some um, hoping to make you feel not strange about going out and asking people for partnerships. Um, is there anyone else who wants to share anything cool that they did or anything that they tried that didn't work? Or, because I know people love to share their like that. <laughs> Actually, funny thing is, everybody wants to hear about other people's failures <coughs> to learn from them, but nobody ever wants to tell about their own. Um, but anything, good or bad, any other cool ideas that you want to share with your group? Yeah, uh -huh. with the reading program coming up, it's uh, in 2013. It's uh, a kind of a digging and underground thing. And I'm part of a federated garden club, so I'm trying to get the garden club folks involved and get the word out. And it's a national organization, so, but it's also statewide as well. So we're trying to get the word out through the state, through the garden club, to have them um, offer to do programs at the libraries and also have the library folk be ready and receptive for when a, a person contacts them from a garden club and suggest doing some kind of gardening program. That's very interesting. So now we said with the reading program coming up that's kind of digging subterranean, what program is that that's... It's a, if there's any such thing as an archaeological club. Right, and we're, we're you know, looking into some of that to some things with um, fossils or archaeological kinds of things. We're that's also very thinking good. of getting hold of um, people in the construction field so that we can have some um, 
back hose and things like that. Close up and personal for the for the children. That's cool. And yeah, maybe you can accidentally get the kids to plant a bunch of flower bulbs or something. You know, do all your fall plantings with the labor from your summer reading programs. <laughs> Okay, anybody else have a last minute cool thing? Yes, ma'am. We um, partnered with American Red Cross and do blood drives at our library, and oh, then we display items that are uh, people might not know that we actually have. And you have kind of a captive audience because they're, they're yeah. waiting before they give and yeah. then waiting so, so that the they have consumed enough so they can leave. That's great. Working with the Red Cross is, is always good. And in fact, if you want to make displays for people while they're donating blood, you know the best place to put them? On the ceiling. Because <laughs> you know when you're laying there for 15 yeah. minutes, like, okay, am I done yet? <laughs> um, that's really cool, too. And I have done some work with the Red Cross. And also <coughs> with my, um, I'm part of the community emergency response team at home with the first, some of the first responders and the police and the firemen. And I'm trying to get them together with my county library system so that in times of emergency, um, you know, they they know what they're doing and what they're dispatching, but sometimes they just need statistics or they need information, like how many whatever do we need to cover in this, you know, or what's the population of this particular town for when we send people in? And I would love to have a librarian on call during a, an emergency to take specific reference questions like that, so to help the uh, the people on the go, you know, on the fly, whenever they're out uh, doing emergency services. So on that high note, <laughs> talking about disasters, um, that's all I have. I'm happy to talk with anyone after. I understand I'm going to see some of you tomorrow too. I hope I've kept you all awake enough uh, to at least take a few new ideas home, things that you haven't thought about before that can blossom into some really beautiful partnerships. So thank you very much for your attention. When we talked on the phone, I said I knew she'd be a great person because of her name. <laughs> and then we found out we're both Kathleen. Yes, so with the K, the only with the K. We are only way to go with Kathleen. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're going home with some new ideas, or maybe some that you've thought about and, and then put aside and not thought about doing, but now have the impetus and the idea to go ahead with it because it really is all about building partnerships and building community. And I think there's a lot of good ideas in here. And I love the one. I've got an idea that would benefit us both. Because I always thought that you should ask what you can do for them, but what can they do for the library too? It should be a two-way street. And so go home tonight, drive safely, think it over, and then wake up tomorrow with a bunch of new ideas, and those of you that are going to be here can come up and tell Kathy. <laughs> so, thank you all very much for coming. Um, we hope you've enjoyed these colloquiums, and I know Brenda and I have enjoyed it. So, have a good trip home, and good night all.